This is an example of how broken, disjointed, and antiquated the beauty industry is inside and finally outside, because this is what the end customer is seeing. The problem doesn't necessarily lie within the fact that this exists. The problem lies within the fact that this was marketed to work. And really our melanated queens were gaslit into thinking this is gonna work for them based on the imagery and the words chosen to market it. Every single touch point of the development process, the supply chain and the distribution, which is the retailer, had an opportunity to speak up. It is a collective failure. The first thing I thought when I received this in PR was they have to be targeting the Asian market. The reason I thought that is well, because I'm the proud owner of not one, but six lavender blushes that have come from K-Beauty. So I know that lavender is hot in Asia. Yves Saint Laurent marketed this to us as a universal blush shade that works on all skin tones. There's the side of what we would consider some of the fairest human skin possible, which this blush looks really beautiful on. And then there's the other side of the spectrum, like Gloria's skin tone, South Sudanese woman, who's really carrying this inclusivity conversation on her shoulders. This is so much bigger than a conversation really about the beauty community. It's an issue of systemic racism, and this is an issue of diversity, equity, and inclusion, once again, being in the back burner instead of at the foreground. It's a loose explanation of the process. But likely the ideation of this blush came from, well, none other than the insane volume of blushes that have launched this year in the liquid category. So of course YSL had on their pipeline to come out with liquid to powder, a transforming texture of blush. The moment that this brief for YSL would have been issued, there would have been a decision on how many shades and what types of shades they wanna launch. Right then and there, that brief goes all the way to the supplier. This was made in France. It's likely that they would have done this in-house because L'Oreal owns YSL Beauty. So that means it could have been done in-house at a L'Oreal facility that manufactured it, or it could have been outsourced to a contract manufacturer that is based in France. We don't know. The blueprint of the construction of this formula base would have sat with a chemist. The chemist is gonna be working on the construction of this base alongside a product developer at their facility. Also, a marketer would have been involved in this process. Together, these three units would have been responsible for bringing to life the sensorial aspect of the formula, which would have then driven and dictated how the chemist would have formulated this. The design of this formula was to go from a cream to a powder. As the chemist was developing this formula base, they would have had the opportunity to sample this base before they submit it to the product development and marketing teams to see if it would get approved. There was a moment during the development process that the chemist could have said, this formula base would not show up on women with darker skin tones. Opportunity one. Through the development process, they would have had multiple rounds of revisions, anywhere from three to 10. We don't know how many versions they did, but each of those versions provided an opportunity for the chemist, the product development team, and the marketing team to say this is too light, too white. That did not happen because this is the final base and shade that was approved. Once this base gets approved, versions in little jars typically find themselves on a set. This set is usually comprised of the creative teams, makeup artistry teams that were hired to paint the faces of the women that were gonna represent the campaign. There's also creative directors that are in charge of the graphics and what we call post-production. So there's a pre-production team, there's a production team, and there's a post-production team. Three different teams all have different roles. The pre-production phase, their job is to receive samples of this blush and to create mood boards of what type of imagery and what type of models will be cast. The people that decided which type of models were cast could have chosen models with lighter skin to actually properly communicate the fact that this will not work on women with that deep of skin tone. Do you think that when they got the photos, they retouched them and they altered? They absolutely had to have retouched them. There's no other way to explain this tone on darker skin. The makeup artists during the production phase had the opportunity to share that these blushes do not show up on the women of color that were cast by the pre-production team. Likely could have, but we don't know. Finally, post-production phase, the marketing team is responsible for working with the creative team that is retouching the photos of the campaign and that is providing the retailers and even their own dot com the information. That's when the marketing team had the opportunity again to rectify the language that they chose to use, which was very intentionally universal when we know that this is not. So that's another opportunity that the company had to actually stop this from coming to market with language that suggested it worked for universal skin tones. We're not done. The retailer had the opportunity to sample this product and say, guess what? 
This is not universal. You cannot represent it as such. Does the retailer care? Because they just want to make sales. The reseller wants to make sales. Should have been well aware that this wouldn't work, even just looking at it, because they work in the beauty industry. They should know that. I've been involved in the way that a product comes from ideation to the retail sales force, so I know the steps. That's why I understand how many opportunities existed for this blush to be marketed differently. Now we're at a point where we need transparency from the brands more than ever before, and we need to elevate the education at every single touch point because it becomes an issue of racism, because it's breeding hate and polarization in the beauty communities. Anything that does that within any culture or society is not something that is gonna help us move forward. It's gonna create divisiveness. Ultimately, these beauty products are designed to be weapons of empowerment. They're not meant to be tools to gaslight. I think that together as a community, we need to demand that YSL makes a statement explaining to us how this got through so many touch points and why they decided to call a blush that's clearly not universal universal. I think if YSL just owned what happened here, it would be very, very healing. I'm well aware that I'm a white woman and I'm talking about these things. I do also identify as a lesbian, which is a marginalized identity. We empathize because of our intersectional identities. It's not a coincidence that we're the lipstick lesbians because we need to reclaim and honor what it means to be a queer woman who actually is feminine and wears makeup. Ultimately, we all want the same thing. We all want to feel beautiful and included and not gaslit. It's that simple. Remember, together we will make this change happen.